Okay, so welcome. We have some time to go through some questions. And I should say that the previous questions have been transcribed and likely edited and now are being produced as some books, which are available if you want to go over the many, many different past topics that we've touched on. So they're indicated on the website. Okay, so I'm putting a new question in first because of the time frame, and you'll understand why. He says, my father is 91 years of age and in the last days of his life. He is already unconscious and unaware of his surroundings. He has never been interested in religion. And I think he's been agnostic all his life. So the question is, apart from accompanying him, is it possible to do more for him? Well, this is a situation that many people face. This man is uh, in a situation where the, ele the elements of his body are starting to dissolve into each other. He's not consciously moving his body and uh, the life energy is moving into the central channel. In that case, the, the subtle earth element that was uh, a basis for the sense of self starts to dissolve into the subtle water element, which goes into the subtle fire element, and then into the subtle wind element, in the, the consciousness that has been uh, organizing his life in many different situations is now just a, like a very fine breath about to dissolve into space. When this uh, subtle consciousness linked with the wind element dissolves into space there's a sense of complete unconsciousness and then you have the the movement away from the bardo of dying which has been these stages of release from this embodied form and you go into this uh, bardo of actuality the chunyi bardo which is the, uh, you come face to face with the emptiness, which is the basis of everything. It's as if there is nothing at all. Now, in our ordinary dualistic consciousness, we spend our lives being busy, trying to get entertainment and pleasure and avoid pain. And we don't really have the experience of being present with nothing. This is why Dharma practice is so important. When we study emptiness and then when we use a tantric practice to dissolve into emptiness, and when in Shen we directly see the empty nature of our mind, that it's not a thing in any way, with all these practices we are preparing for this moment of death. But it appears that this gentleman has not had the opportunity to practiced in this way. And so if we are sitting beside someone in this state, it's very helpful to release uh, our concerns and uh, our desire to do something into the out breath and just remain relaxed and open. Because his consciousness is separating from the body, it has no boundary. And then it's easier for our state of openness to link with the dying person's state of potential for openness. This state of, as it were, pure emptiness doesn't last for long. Then experience arises from emptiness. For example, in the Padmasambhava practice, we pray to Padmasambhava, we unify with Padmasambhava, we enter emptiness with Padmasambhava, and then we arise from that as Padmasambhava. In this way, we uh, dissolve the duality of something versus nothing. If you like, something or appearances emerge from emptiness as the display of emptiness. So that when the visions of the peaceful and wrathful deities and then karmic visions arise, if we can see directly that their ground 
is not some internal existence of themselves, but is the same empty ground that we have. If we, if we can see this, then the idea that uh, we are being uh, invaded or attacked by these deities or they're trying to take us somewhere uh, is, is not terrifying because we are dreamlike forms moving in a dreamlike space. We can do this, uh, the practice of the Guru Yoga of the three R sitting next to the person. This open throat, empty eye is a very releasing and relaxing sound. And we sit in space with the consciousness of someone that is now dissolving into space. The waves of this life dissolve into this infinite ocean and then new waves arise. The new waves in the ocean are the same as the old waves because they are all water. The new forms that arise in the bardo are the same as the old forms in this life because they are appearance and emptiness. They are the same in their emptiness, yet different in their appearance. Which is why when we do our practice and we experience sitting when we are sad, when we are sick, when we are happy, we see these different potentials arising from emptiness. The person is not vanishing into the unknown. They are merging into the ground of their being, which has always been there. And depending on the resonance that they have, the kind of energetic or uh, karmic vibration, which is manifesting in this moment, they will uh, align themselves with the with emptiness itself directly and liberate in the Dharmakaya or align with the peaceful and wrathful deities and gain liberation in the Sambhogakaya or if the vibration is uh, more uh, solid, more uh, linked to the five elements, then we take birth in a human body or a body in any of the six realms. All of these forms are manifestations of emptiness. They are not real. They are not separate. If we see this directly, if we know this through our practice, then there is nothing to be fearful of. When we are sitting with somebody who has not done practice in their life, it's important not to display the emotions of loss or sadness. They are letting go of the form they had in this life. If they were your father, they are no longer your father. When they were born, they were a potential which manifested in dependent origination with many influences. And this pattern of formation is now dissolving. It's not that someone is dying, but more the formation which arose in dependence on the collaboration of the five elements in the eight consciousness is now dispersing. They are going and we let them go. We don't hang on to them with our thoughts or memories or emotions. We breathe in, we breathe out. When we breathe out, we let go of the breath. Then a new breath comes in. So in that simple, easy way, we release our preoccupation with this person on the basis of who they were for us and what we thought about them and rest in a state of openness. Well, we do this as much as we can. It depends where the person is, but if they are at home, then it's a good thing not to move them about too much. And if they're in a hospital situation, if they a judge to be dead and they have to be moved, if you can uh, see that that is done in as gentle a way as possible, so that the full release of the consciousness from the bodily form is uh, not interrupted. So the next question is, does Dzogchen agree with the view that all events and occurrences 
are a result of previous events and occurrences. And that one's experience will continue to evolve and unfold naturally, just like that, as it is meant to. The short answer is no. Only on a relative level do we become who we are through the influence of interactions with the environment. The actual ground, moment by moment, is ungraspable emptiness. Each moment is fresh. When we don't attend to the immediacy of our uh, phenomenal reception through the senses, we rely on concepts. And the notion of uh, karma, of uh, something manifest now on the basis of previous actions, this is a conceptual interpretation. In terms of the unchanging truth, this is just an illusion. In terms of the relative truth or the fictional truth of subject and object, then through the way that we come into the world with our hopes and fears, intentions and so on, we gather towards us certain ele elements and push away other elements, um, friendships, employment, drugs, and so on. That is to say, our subjectivity is a patterning of potential. And the experiential field that we act on with our intention is also uh, something without inherent existence. What we take to be truly existing out there is the projection of our own mind. So when we look at the patterns of our experience in the world with others, we're looking out as a subject to an object. And this gives us certain aspects of meaning according to the relative truth, which starts from the belief that subject and object are real and separate. But in Sokshen, we are concerned to relax through the clouds and veils generated by our repeated activity. This activity is like putting a kettle on the fire and as the water boils, steam fills the room. So we make, you can make fire by rubbing two sticks together. And you make mental heat by rubbing subject and object together. But the Sokshen begins by looking within, looking directly at your mind, not looking out through the uh, deceptive lens of duality. Oh, in our Nyingmapa tradition, we have nine separate yanas or vehicles, each of which has its own view. Oh, it's important to study at least a little bit the difference between the Theravadan and the Mahayana, in the Mahayana uh, Sutra form and Tantra, because each of these views uh, is oriented around certain uh, core beliefs. The view of people not uh, influenced by Dharma begins with the axiom or uh, unexamined belief that I exist. This is not put into question. And this uh, belief is inserted into each moment of life and becomes the, the tool or the means by which we make sense of the experiences which arise. When we come into Dharma, we start to see that uh, the formations of myself are impermanent. They arise due to causes and conditions. Neither I nor any of the people I have ever met had an inherent existence. When I say, this is my mother, this is my father, this is like saying this cloud looks like an elephant. Now, it's easier to see the truth with the cloud than the elephant. I think this cloud looks like an elephant. And you say, no, look at these little straggly bits. It looks like an octopus. Now, 
on the basis of this, we might think, oh, maybe it's neither an elephant nor an octopus, it's a potential. In the person I say mother to is not your mother. You call someone else mother. Oh, we see mother is not something inherent in that person. It's a, an identification. So this is how we move into the Mahayana view that there is no uh, inherent existence in anything, that every ap appearance is inseparable from emptiness. The fact that we say, oh, these are all, all different aspects of Dharma, we have to be careful with thoughts like this. Because if we are practitioners, if we want to understand and engage in the practice, we need to be clear about what is the basic view by which we enter into the practice. The view of cause and effect you find in the Theravadan and in the Mahayana, but it's not the dominant view of Zokpachembo. It's not that one is right and one is wrong, but according to how you view, what you see will be revealed in different ways. But we need to do a bit more study to clarify what are the basic starting points of Sokshin. From the very beginning, everything, everything has been inseparable from the ground. Oh, it doesn't need to be purified, it's already pure. Each moment, each formation of our existence has been inseparable from emptiness. So our practice is to relax and open to the open ground from which manifestation occurs. That's why we do the kind of practice we do. If we were starting from the position that I am real and I have done bad things, then my felt sense, my, my belief that I am bad and burdened by guilt would have to be taken seriously. And therefore, uh, it would be important to do Vajrasattva purification practice. But in many countries, like in Spain, uh, there has been not much rainfall. And, and so you have to be careful with water. If the clothes are clean, why are you washing them again? This is wasteful. So if your mind has been pure from the very beginning, please don't do purification. But if these words don't mean anything to you and you think, oh, but I'm a very troubled person and I get carried away by my thoughts, then purification is very important. Okay, then the next question. Should the fear of death diminish as we become more stable in meditation? Well, that again would depend on the kind of meditation that you do. If you were reflecting a lot on suffering in the six realms, then you might well have an increase in your fear of death. Eight hot hells, eight cold hells, two intermediate hells, born as a chicken in a big factory farm and they take your beak off and your claws off. So if you have a strong belief that you exist and that you as you are are going to be reborn in another place and will experience your own karmic destiny, then some anxiety about death might be very important. So again, it depends on what we mean by meditation. And then the question is the disappearing of fears, a sign of enlightenment or progress? Well, it could be. We have to be precise. There is no such thing as Buddhism. This is a Western concept. In the Tibetan language, they say, Nangpa and Chipa, you are an insider or an outsider. And if you are an insider in Dharma, you start to walk through this incredible garden of Dharma with many different kinds of flowers. And you then find what uh, kind of uh, flower or what kind of uh, teaching speaks to you, what touches you, what seems to resonate with your own 
felt sense of self. So if we don't have a huge amount of time to do practice, then asking big questions like this may simply be punishing to ourselves. We just do the practices that we have time to do, observe the impermanence of our walking, our cooking, our gardening, whatever activities we do. And then if we become familiar with the sense that I feel like this, and this feeling is vanishing, it's dissolving away. I'm not who I think I am. Therefore, to continue relying on my thoughts to tell me who I am is pretty stupid. So rather than thinking about the world, about the future, about myself, I'm going to relax and be present with life as it flows through this sight, which is my present awareness. So the next question is, when we engage in sitting meditation, attempting to remain in non-dual Rigpa awareness, how long should the sessions last? This is a very sweet and kind of sad question. Tell me how I should do it. What should I do? You must know something about me. You will know what will be best for me. From there are many, many methods of meditation, like in Tantra, where there are many things to learn, and you really need someone to show you how to do mudras and make tormas and so on. But when we are, uh, when our, uh, when our practice is to relax into open awareness, into Rigpa, this is about a relationship with ourselves my tendencies to jump into the object, my tendencies to get distracted, my habit of judging how I'm doing. We need to observe ourselves and learn from ourselves. If you had a long day at work or looking after children and you decide you watch a film to relax and it's a film you really want to see, but you keep falling asleep. Maybe better to go to bed. Because if you keep waking yourself up, I want to see the film, I want to see the film. You're saying the film is important. And I am the servant of the film. All day long, you were the servant of your boss, the servant of your children. Better to have a holiday. So, Dzogchen is about what is natural, what is intrinsic, what is just always here, although veiled from us. And it's veiled from us by the uh, stream of our own cogitations, our thoughts, memories, and so on. So we need to be close to ourselves and work with the circumstances of our embodied presence. Dzogchen is based on awareness, on being uh, not preoccupied, not being driven, not being rule bound, but simply being a, an aware presence. Oh, in general, we, we say, as I have often said, you should start maybe with five minutes and then 10 minutes and gradually build it up. But you might have a, a good day when you, you sit and, oh, everything seems very easy. You're relaxed and open and you could sit for an hour without much effort. Another time when you sit down, you're troubled about something, maybe difficulty in a relationship. And you just keep spinning around with these thoughts. Then it's probably better to go for a walk. Look at the buildings, the trees, the sky. And allow this big space to uh, give you a, a, a new perspective on 
the situation which is tormenting you. Now, what I'm saying might make you feel a bit lonely. Oh, once again, it's all up to me. I have to work it out. But it's not that I'm trying to abandon you to uh, some lonely endeavor. Rather, it's an invitation to get closer to yourself. Uh, and in this uh, intimacy, you, you start to see directly the arising of the thought. And that if you don't merge with it, it goes free by itself. In order to see this, it's important just to be here, relaxed, open. We're not go here in this model, in this yana, we're not being goal oriented. We're not trying to get to a better place or a clearer understanding. We are here. We're always here and now. And the practice is to relax into the facticity, the givenness, the immediacy of that. The ground has never left you and you have never left the ground. You don't need to make it happen. It is. Mind is open. Today you have had so many experiences. Happy, sad, expansive, contracting. This is only possible because your mind is empty. If your thoughts and feelings were things, they would be building up like pouring grains of rice into the bottom of a tin. After some hours, the tin will fill. Your mind is open and empty, but your tendency is to be a bit fixated on what is occurring in this emptiness. So your appearance, the appearance catches the attention of the subjective ego. That's why we relax out of the subjective ego in the Guru Yoga of the White R. And then the texts say, whatever comes, comes. Sometimes as you're sitting open, what seems to be coming is a lot of me, a lot of uh, personal thoughts, subjective feelings. And sometimes what's happening is uh, maybe perception of what you hear or see or uh, thoughts about tomorrow or what happened yesterday. These thoughts are like hooks. They will hook the your sense of being an individual ego entity. Because being situated in this individualized uh, I exist position we don't have an even attitude our experience is mediated through our hopes and fears our likes and dislikes so when uh, a thought arises and you have this sense of being involved in it and you go off on a little story I'm thinking about this the key is to see, I'm thinking about this, is also a thought. The thought in the form of I am the thinker, and the thought in the form of this is something I think about, are both emergent and vanishing. <coughs> this is the vital key point of suction. Your ego identity cannot do zokshin. Your ego identity can uh, boil an egg, it can uh, take a shower, it can do all sorts of things. But it can't see its own illusoriness. You boil your egg and you go to eat it and you think, ah, I cooked it too much, it's very hard. This is your internal dialogue, subject on object, subject on object. Both polarities of this subject object play are empty and illusory and already vanishing. So in order to see this, you need to have a quite a subtle sense of presence. I can force myself to clean the bathroom. The structure of that is 
I split myself into the subject part. I need to do this. I want to do this. And this subject part directs itself onto the agency of the aspect of my embodied self, which can make the cleaning happen. Now, in order to survive in the world, we need to be able to activate this uh, dualistic functioning. But it is not, <clears throat> it is not an aid to our Dzogchen practice. Because hanging on to the sight of our ego subjectivity, I am the doer, I am the maker. If I don't do it, no one else will do it for me. This is an stimulating or agitating uh, conceptualization which keeps us tilted towards the future but we're already here and now the aim of Sokshen is to be here now always and without effort awareness is always here dualistic uh, consciousness the directing force of I, me, myself is like a mad monkey. I don't need to do it because it's already done. This is the meaning of the Tibetan term, Zogpa uh, Chembo. Chembo means great. And Zogpa uh, means finished, complete. And it's the great completion because nobody has worked to make it complete it is self-complete and uh, here the, the this term chembo indicates emptiness the the ungraspability of the the ground source of everything nothing is outside of this openness just as nothing is outside the here and now if I say this morning my leg was sore, I'm saying it now. The past, if you like, the past has come into the present. I can't go into the past. It's, it's gone. But I can delude myself by relying on a conceptual elaboration, a storytelling that, oh, yes, this morning my leg was very sore. We can grasp ideas about things, but the things themselves, which are not really things, which are uh, empty, ungraspable appearances, they display themselves, but you can't catch them. They are naked. Moment by moment, these naked strippers are there dancing in front of you. So being cautious of having a sexist charge placed against me, we will call them dakinis. Moving, dancing, changing, but you can't catch them. You catch their shadow, their echo, and your hand remains empty. I thought I was getting something. So you grasp again and again. And the whole life is based on grasping at the fantasy that entities exist. We want to release ourselves from that deluded activity. So in order to do that, we have to be close to ourselves and allow how our mind is to reveal itself. That's why uh, having rules about how long the session should be is not very helpful. It's another question. Is it possible to retain awareness when under the influence of alcohol, cannabis, and so on? Now, this is quite an interesting question. But again, it's being formulated in a very abstract way. Is it possible? Is it possible for who? In the 60s, there was a famous Nim Karoli Baba in India. And, uh, Ram Das, American, gave him some uh, LSD. And according to the story, he took it and sat there and said, oh, yeah, not as good as meditation. 
Then there's a second bit to the question. Can hallucinogens be helpful in breaking habitual modes of perception? Or do they just lead up the blind alley of attention focused on content? The key point here is maybe you don't have enough time to explore and experiment with all the possible pathways in life. The path begins with you. How are you? Not who are you or what are you, but how are you? And how you are is shifting and changing according to circumstances. There's a lot to observe in how you are. So if you don't know how you are, why would you take substances which will shift how you are? Everything about us is impermanent. If we attend to how we are, we will see the subtle shifts of our impermanent manifestations. But you can take substances which will intensify how you change. Some people have one glass of wine and they feel a little bit, oh, that was strong. At least they know that something has happened. Other people can drink a bottle of wine or more and still feel, oh, I'm just me. So it's interesting, all these questions this evening, it, it is as if they're uh, wanting to find some normative truth. How should I live? What should I do? From the point of view of Sokshen, the most important thing is to look now at this very moment how I am. If you like, this is a, a kind of um, vipassana without a, a specific focus. The object of our attention is what is ever arising in our mind. When you stay close to that, these more objectifying questions will no longer be so tempting for you. Oh, the next question is more straightforward. When sitting in practice, we put the tip of the tongue on the roof of the mouth, where precisely? Now, again, we don't do this in all practices. We do it primarily when we are focusing our attention. Behind your upper teeth, there is a, a firm kind of ridge of the back gum, the, the palate, the hard palate. So, the, the tip of your tongue is resting on and slightly pressing on the middle of that ridge. This is said to be a, a, an energy point which will help to uh, limit distraction. Then the next question, do we have a curriculum for a Nagpa training and ordination in the Simply Being Sangha? The answer to that is no. And I've already explained that uh, a curriculum is, is a formulation which is outside yourself. We are concerned to awaken to the immediate actuality of how we are. Then the next question, how can we begin to recognize the ego aspects of ourselves more clearly? How to approach this in a helpful way, not being sucked in or pushing it away? On an outer level, this is what friends are for. If you have a good friend, you could ask them, please tell me when I'm being annoying. Tell me if I'm talking too much. Tell me if I'm asking you invasive questions. Because while we are merged in these activities, they seem quite natural for us. So getting feedback from someone else can, can help to uh, separate us from the fusion into our habitual activity. So when, when we talk of the ego, it's referring to this sense of uh, I am myself. <clears throat> I exist as myself. I am me. Now, if you needed that aspect in order to survive, uh, to get enlightened, you wouldn't want to get rid of it. But 
even the great uh, yogis and the great lamas talk about I. So when you meet someone like that and they're talking about themselves, you can see that the I is like the arising crest of a wave. That is to say, the I describes the pattern of emergence into participation in the world. When we uh, try to locate the, the site of this ego self inside our mind, our embodiment, we can't find anything substantial. That is to say, I is a, a naming or a sign which is placed on emptiness. I am empty of inherent content. The content of my mind shifts and turns and moves. Moment by moment, I could identify with some of these things which arise, but then they're gone. I am empty, open and empty. But I'm not just empty. Thoughts, feelings, sensations arise. I am a space of subtle experience, no one else has direct access to this immediacy of emergence of, of experience. If I want to tell you that I feel sad, I put, I put it into language. I say sad. Now, this word sad will have a pattern of resonance for you that may well be rather different from the pattern of resonance for me. And so it's likely that on the basis of your associations to the word sad, associations developed through your family background, your love life and so on, <clears throat> on the basis of that, you imagine that you understand what I mean by sad. This is why being in the world with others is very difficult. So in the Dzogchen lineage, it begins with the primordial Buddha, Samantabhadra, who has never been within samsara. And his mind is open and clear. And his openness connects with the openness of Vajrasattva. They're not thinking about anything. They're not talking about anything. It's just space and space with no barrier between. Vajrasattva holds Vajra, the symbol of emptiness. So this is a subtle manifestation. It's not just the, the Vajra of emptiness, but it's the, the Vajra symbol of the Vajra of emptiness. And this is conveyed to Garab Dorji. And he speaks, he uses language. And language has to be interpreted. And we each interpret according to this complex hall of mirrors of our associations. So, this is the three kayas, the openness of the Dharmakaya, the symbolic uh, illusory clarity of the Sambhogakaya. And then we have the manifestation of the Nirmanakaya, which is manifestation into a complex world of interaction. This is the domain of interpretation. And this is where misunderstanding can arise. So returning to the question, how can we recognize uh, the manifesting of our egoic sense of self? It's marked by struggle, by bias and partiality, by a limited access to the richness of the, the immediacy of the field. And uh, most importantly, perhaps, our ego self is uh, marked by a self-referentiality. I position myself into the interaction. 
if there's a kind of reflexive move in which I say, oh, I love your new shoes. And overtly, I'm talking about your shoes. But the subtext is, hey, I know something about shoes and these are good ones. So you can observe for yourself how your ego functions and how different it is from the description of presence or awareness. It's a bit confusing since both can be referred to as I. But one is solid and self-asserting. And the other is relaxed, spacious and open. So we can't approach it through theory. But only by being with ourselves in our lostness, in our moments of clarity. And gradually we come to see how we are. Okay, so now we come to the end. Thanks very much to Pedro for managing the, the flow of the uh, video connectivity and our translators who make our connection across continents possible. And uh, to each of you for opening yourselves to an ever deeper relationship with the Dharma. So we have some dates which are up on the website and uh, if, if you're interested, we'll meet again at these times. Now, I have a look. Now I can see more faces and how wonderful all these faces are. This is amazing. Here we are in this precious life, which passes very quickly. But we have these moments. We are here and then gone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.